It is a sad day, Winston. She will live on forever in our hearts. Surely, Winston. And for this is but a memorial service. There may yet be news from Von Croy in Egypt. Indeed. We can only hope and pray that she may yet return to us. But I fear Von Croy digging in the hopes of discovering her alive may only be met with black reality. Indeed, indeed. Welcome everyone to Let's Play Tomb Raider 5 Chronicles, this will get his 115 speaking. And let me just start by saying, Lara Croft is dead! Or so it would seem. <laughs> ah, so happy to be back after the Times exclusive level of Tomb Raider 4. And uh, let me just start out by saying I am fully well aware how controversial Tomb Raider 5 Chronicles is. Nevertheless, I... At the time I played it, I really loved the levels offered. I thought that the game engine was really maximized to its full potential, as we're gonna see as we delve into its unique levels. So first things first. I am very excited to finally tackle a globetrotting adventure, uh, sort of. Unlike Tomb Raider 4 The Last Revelation, it will not be taken exclusively in one geographical location. Uh, instead, it will span four different regions. I am not necessarily going to spoil what those are, or maybe I will. We'll see how I'll decide. But first things first, uh, let me show you something for full transparency. These are the settings that I am using. I have lowered the sound, uh, and I'm using the automatic targeting feature, because I don't believe the manual lock-on adds any value to the game control scheme. Also, these are my control configurations, in case you're interested on my laptop keyboard that I'm using. Anyway, that's just for reference. Something I want to be very transparent about is the Tomb 5 options you will see here. If you just install the game and run it, you will not see this option, and that's because this is a fan-made utility. I know, I know, might be a bit controversial, but let me explain. The main reason why I installed this in the first place is to run the game properly on an up-to-date widescreen. As you can see, the game looks, uh, well, perhaps better from what you remember, and that's because of the Tomb 5, and a couple of more uh, tweaks. I will provide links in the video description so that you can also check this feature out and see how you can modify the game yourself to make uh, full use of the widescreens nowadays, because it did come with a native widescreen support, however, it's rough, let me put it like that. <laughs> to make this work was a huge project and long process, but finally I think it was on Tomb of Ash where I found this fan-made utility. Furthermore, there are a couple of tweaks I'm using, all of them should be visual only and none of them should affect the gameplay, but for full transparency's sake, here they are, and this will also tell you the kind of neat features that you can get with this fan-made mod. First of all, I have enabled the PlayStation version footprints. I think it's only going to be relevant in one level in the entire game, but still, I missed those in the PC version. Secondly, you can set up all sorts of shadow options here. I'm using the original TR5 one, shadow mode as well. Uh, then, uh, this is probably the best feature about this mod, which I'm not using, my god. Uh, remember back in Tomb Raider 4 I was complaining about how unwieldy Lara feels, as opposed to Tomb Raider 2 and 3 especially? That's because there is a delay with every single climb, and also the same thing happens when crawling, and this fixes it. However, in my opinion this changes up the gameplay somewhat, can potentially make the game easier, 
can make us uh, get across the levels faster. So I'm not gonna be using it, but I highly recommend that you do. I'm actually gonna show it in practice when we start the first level. Same thing goes for flexible crawlings. Then you can also skip the cutscenes, which is a godsend for speedrunners or people just replaying Tomb Raider Chronicles. I'm not gonna be using this myself. I wanna show you the cutscenes. They're the best cutscenes in the franchise so far, in my humble opinion. But I understand that it's not always fun to sit down for two and a half minutes and do nothing. So that's an option. I'm not gonna be using any cheats. To be honest, I'm not even sure what those cheats are. I'm, I'm not interested, but in case you are, have fun, enjoy them. Then uh, the bar positions, I actually am improved. That has to do with the widescreen resolution fix. That means our oxygen, sprint bar and health bar is gonna be positioned in a much more suitable manner on the screen. Again, nothing gameplay changing, just visual. Then, something that could be argued as game-changing is the enemy bars. I was pondering this for the longest time because the original game, you shouldn't see how much health the enemies have remaining. But for the purposes of a let's play or any kind of guide, I think it's extremely valuable. Plus, I am now in the process of working on a guide for another game from early 2000s, where enemy health bars play a very important role. Uh, those of you in my audience who are from Poland, uh, let me just say you know this German game and you very probably love it and you'll be happy to see I'm tackling it. That's all I'm gonna say right now. Um, then I also added an ammunition counter on the screen, which was sorely missing from Tomb Raider 4. Uh, something from PlayStation version, game over menu. When we die, we'll see the game over screen, which will allow us to reload the game or take us back to the title screen. It it is kind of useless, you can just load, you still have a few seconds to load after you die, but if you don't, the game takes you automatically to the main menu screen, so I guess this is a bit more efficient. Honestly, I just find it incredibly funny when we die in an awkward way and there's the game over screen. It's very Souls-like in a way, and I hate that using that expression, but uh, I don't know, it's something I missed in the PC version. Secondly, I turned off volumetric fog effects. You can do the same thing, this is not new to this mod, you can do the same thing via the setup utility that comes with the PC version. I have turned it off for Tomb Raider 4, I have also turned it off for Tomb Raider 5 because I think it makes the levels look absolutely horrendous. Then uh, the camera movement I kept original, uh, the bar mode as well, it just means the textures of the different sprint, health and oxygen bars. And there's a whole other page with a few things, scroll tilting, again this makes scrolling more seamless and better and I highly recommend you use it, but I'm not gonna because it changes the control somewhat and I want to stick to the original as much as I can. Secondly. BSX skies. Now, I'm kind of hoping we'll get to see a screen with the skies, but if not, I'm gonna show you in the very first level. The sky boxes that entered the PC version of the game were completely messed up. I am not a big fan. As such, this restores the original PlayStation quality. Somehow the PlayStation sky boxes just look better. Secondly, this is optional. You can change the loading screens into sort of a screenshots of a level just like the Tomb Raider 4, uh, option that I explained in greater detail in the Lost Library level. But I want to stick to the original as much as I can, plus this mod in fact restores some of the original loading screens. So again, I'm not gonna use this, I'm gonna actually show you what the loading screens, which are basically just screenshots of FME cutscenes look like, because if you just put the out-of-the-box PC version in and run it, there are no loading screens, it's all a bit messed up. Uh, then uh, the loading screen style, again the original, mono screen style original, and loading tanks during those loading screens. So that's it. You'll see some of the loading screens in effect very soon. So that was me for full transparency sake. Oh, and by the way, interesting thing, uh, if you enable the cutscene skipper and now press the escape key during any of these action sequences in the main menu, you get to skip them. Isn't that crazy? And the reason is that these are in fact cutscenes. You cannot do the same. Now I'm pressing escape key in the flybys. The reason is that in the PS version of the game, in the main menu, these action sequences from New York levels, uh, they are in fact demos that play in the background. In the PC version, they managed to integrate it so you can flawlessly scroll through the menus as well. But uh, with, it is in fact a cutscene, and using this uh, fan-made utility uh, uncovers it for what it is. So I thought it's an interesting thing. The whole main menu consists of four flybys that you cannot skip, and four action sequences that you can skip, because those are PlayStation demos recreated in the PC version. So, interesting bit of trivia. But I feel like I've spent too much time in the main menu. How about we jump into the game and see what's new? To the study, gentlemen, where we may pontificate. 
wait over the day's disheartening events. Indeed, my friend, even the heavens cry out. Ah, the Philosopher's Stone. One of Lara's early conquests, and one of her most challenging pursuits, if my memory serves me. And Rome still bears the scars of that little episode. Ah, she was never one for diplomacy, Lara. But she certainly knew how to paint the town red. A girl darn, ain't she just a picture? Ah, the charming Mr. Larson. Has Pierre let you off the leash? Talking of which, where is our learned friend? Oh, he's around. You got the cash? I've got the cash, but I don't deal with the monkey. <laughs> well, now that ain't polite for a lady. Even if the monkey has the mercury stone. Lucky I'm in a generous mood. Ah, crawled out from under your rock, I see. No need for unpleasantries, Miss Croft. I'm afraid I must, once again, relieve you of your burden. Easy come, easy go. May I just say how much I love the cutscenes in this game? I think I already said it, but I'll say it again. They are great. The quality has improved so much. <laughs> and I'm very happy to see Larson and Pierre, our pals, and... Uh sort of rivals from Tomb Raider 1. Now I believe this entire story in Rome chapter should take place before the events of Tomb Raider 1's Greece, right? We are in Rome in Italy. Um, so whatever's gonna happen, we know that they're gonna make it out just fine. Pierre will die in Greece and uh, Larson will die in Egypt, at least according to the core era continuity. In anniversary they change it somewhat and you know what? I think I prefer the anniversary changes. Anyway, let me welcome you to the streets of Rome. This is the very first level of the game. We are going to be finding three secrets, 33 items. We are going to kill five out of six enemies. One of the unkillable enemies is going to make two appearances, but I'm counting it as one unkillable guy. It's going to be Larson. And we are going to break six objects. And yeah, it's, I think, a decent introduction level. And like in Tomb Raider 4, you're not forced into any tutorial. You can optionally take a detour through the opera backstage that Lara was just in, and Lara will give you a couple of hints in terms of the control. I'll try to add a couple of hints as well. Originally, I planned to make this incredibly detailed control scheme video, then I realized, hold on a sec, this is getting out of proportions. Instead, I will make a separate video on the entire control scheme of Tomb Raider 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, as the controls evolved. Uh, be on the lookout for that, I'm super looking forward to it, I'll try to explain different inputs, uh, different situations where different moves are useful and basically everything you can do gameplay-wise with Lara. It should be a lot of fun for those of you new to the franchise. Anyway, back to the present day. Uh, before we head on, I recommend you do go through the Opera backstage, just for the purposes of finding a few goodies and also the first secret of the level. So. Arguably the tutorial is not really optional, but even within the tutorial opera backstage you can skip a lot of the content. Before I continue and Lara will start talking, let me introduce you to a move 
that I had no idea already exists in Tomb Raider 4. I really apologize for this most profoundly. You can go from a sprint into a crawl. Did you know about this move? I had no idea whatsoever. I thought all you can do with a sprint is dash or make a jumping somersault or just awkwardly stop. But no, you can also go into a crawl and this works just like a safety walk or a dash would. And you can keep rolling, oh my goodness. And this, I went back to Tomb Raider 4, you can actually keep doing it there as well. I think this is actually a cut move from Tomb Raider 3. In some of the demos it was highlighted, but never implemented into the main game. I went back to Tomb Raider 3 to try it, you cannot do that. But in Tomb Raider 4 and 5, they, I guess, fixed something and it was finally ready for deployment. Now, there are two more moves new to Tomb Raider 5. One of them I'm going to show you in this tutorial, and another I'm not going to be able to show you in the Rome or the Russia chapters of the game. We'll have to wait, I believe, till Ireland and New York to show you. But anyway, we'll get cross that bridge when we get there. First of all, let me take you here. To climb onto this crate, stand next to the crate, push forward, and then action. Yeah, I was worried that we'll be rudely interrupted again. Not by Moncroy this time around, but by Jonel Elliott voicing Lara uh, for her second role in this franchise so far. Her third was the Angel of Darkness. Before we get to climbing, let me explain something. Ahead are a couple of interconnected areas. Uh, there are some tunnels, and we can explore right now. In case you ever fall down or need to restart something, you can use these to sort of get around and do it all over again. By the way, these things, they're not ladders and are not climbable as such. But anyway, lovely opera uh, backstage uh, backdrops, and here is the final room. You can actually climb on this crate and continue and skip a significant portion of this tutorial, but, you know, since we are here, let's make full advantage of it. Okay, so couple of things I want to highlight. Uh, since Lara will be guiding us through this level, I also want to offer my own commentary on the control scheme. So, by moving forward and pressing the action key, you know Lara will climb up. Depending on the altitude, a different animation will trigger. And this is, I guess, the ultimate one. Up to, I believe, around two squares uh, height, Lara can make a jump, grab a ledge and climb it. However, uh, I'm going to go back into the menu of the Tomb 5 mod. Let's take a look at this. This is not me pressing the forward key too late. There is a one second delay in climbing, and it is something I complained about in Tomb Raider 4. If you enable uh, the climb up delay fix, Lara will seamlessly climb like back in Tomb Raider 2 and 3. Actually, I think even in 1, all the game was a bit slower. So I can't recommend this enough, however, to keep the virtue of this being the original release as much as I can, so that the guide is actually useful to you guys, I'm gonna disable this. The same thing goes with crawling. Look, look how quickly Lara goes from being prone to crawl to moving. It's wonderful. Look how quickly she turns. If we disable this, there is a small skip in animation every single time. So. It's just so clumsier. So again, I do recommend these, but I'm not going to use them for the purposes of the guide. Let me... Okay, no delay. I'm, you know what, I'm kind of starting to regret my decision. <laughs> At any rate. So that's that. Uh, another important thing and a new move I want to highlight to you is uh, really tied to crawling. And that's this. Move forward as far as you can, and then press the jump key, not the action key. You don't even need to press forward, and Lara will do a flip like this. Now, this is something I really desired back in times of Tomb Raider 3, because having to turn around every single time when crawling was incredibly annoying. Now you no longer have to, you can get out forwards. But this move is useful in another way, and I will explain. There is the so-called safety drop. In case you want to minimize the damage from a fall when you want to descend, you need to go back, hop back and uh, hold the action key so Lara will lower her entire body down and then let go and she will fall down, minimizing the damage she would take otherwise by her own body's altitude. However, and this doesn't make any sense, if you do the same thing via the crawl flip, you will reduce the falling damage even further. I have tested this a couple of times during falls where you have to take damage 
And it, in fact, helps you conserve even more health. So from now on, instead of the standard safety drops, whenever we can, I'll be using the crawl forward flips. It's brilliant tool to have in Lara's toolbox. Anyway, let's go onward. To leap this short distance, walk to the edge. Now press forward and jump together. Easy. Your normal standing jump, as you can see, it just about covers two squares distance. And now, woohoo! Now let's try a longer leap. Walk to the edge, then tap back once. Now press forward and jump together. Okay, before we do that, let me just show you something. In case you sprint and hold the sprint key for a dash, it works as a safety walk. Lara will not walk off edges or fall down. And the same thing works for crawling. So again, uh, it, there's an additional safety measure implemented. It is incredibly useful in that regard. Now, uh, Lara basically taught us how to make a running jump with the run-up. If you hop back once, you'll cover one square distance. Now, before we continue, um, there is a small health bag we can get our hands on over here, and we can do it now or we can do it later. It doesn't really matter, but it's really interesting because this object Lara keeps running into as if it's a dynamic one, and yet she can grab its top and walk onto it. Yet from certain angles, Lara will never climb up. I do not understand why. Anyway, now that we are here, uh, let's get our hands on a small health bag. Oh, and before that, I haven't shown you the starting inventory. So first of all, we come with our pistols, we come with our lovely binoculars, we come with, again, same thing as in Tomb Raider Falls, Tomb of Seth, or the Times Exclusive level, three flares, even though a box of flares constitutes of 12 flares. I do not understand. Instead of the compass, we have the Timex TMX, which I think is a sponsored product, which is a sign of bad times in the development, but this serves really no purpose. You can use it and it will take you to the statistics screen the same way as a pause screen would, right? It's the same thing. There is no point to have this additional object in our inventory. In the PS1 version, however, it is useful because in PS1 version, you cannot get to the statistics screen via the pause menu. I do not know why. So there it can be justified, but in PC version, it's just another object you need to scroll through. I, I cannot stand it. Secondly, we started the game with three small health packs. We just picked up the fourth one one large health pack and a mercury stone. The thing that Larson was so proudly showing to Lara in the opera cutscene. The mercury stone is not the philosopher's stone that Lara's friends reminiscing about her adventures were talking about, no. This is basically uh, one half of one of the four keys to enter, enter a tomb or a temple or an underground complex where the philosopher's stone is, right? So I'm surprised Lara had to pay with it with a briefcase full of money. Anyway, sounds like she got both her money and the stone back. Then uh, we see the safe and load uh, floppy disks. Interesting thing, these replace the stone tablets in Tomb Raider 4. However, in the PS1 version of the game, uh, you don't have floppy disks because it's a PlayStation, right? So they actually just reuse the stone tablets from Tomb Raider 4 in the PS1 version of the game. In the PC one, they added these lovely floppies. I prefer this much more. And that's it. Secondly, uh, Pistols. We know how to use guns, holster, unholster, action key to fire. If you fire, the statistics will keep track of the ammo used since we fired with every single pistol. Once, that's two shots fired. And different weapons will spend ammunition in different way. Uh, again, I'm not going to be able to show you any total accuracy count in the final statistics video because the game doesn't keep track of how many shots you hit with. Now, finally, binoculars. I love these things. I'm going to use every opportunity I can to use them. Uh, you can holster them just like you would a weapon. Unfortunately, there is no PC hotkey to use these with, but you can zoom in via the crawl key and zoom out via the sprint key. I don't know why it's this way. I feel like it should be the other way. But anyway, it does this lovely sci-fi sound. That's because there's going to be a different object in our inventory replacing the binox where this kind of side makes a bit more sense. If you press the action key, you light it up, just like in Tomb Raider 4. So, very happy that the binox are back. And then we have the flares. Uh, I'll explain how to use them when we'll find ourselves in a situation to do that. As you can see, from 3 flares to 15, we got 12 flares via one pickup. And over here, you need to actually enter via crawl to get your hands on the large health pack. And let's just go back. Okay, so that was a very exhausting explanation of our starting inventory. You can actually already continue that to that letter, but you'll miss out on some of Lara's instructions, and since that's why we're here, Let's not do that. Let's stick to the main path. And now for the big jump. Walk to the edge, then tap back once. Now press forward and jump together. When in midair, hold action to grab onto the ledge. 
Shame Lara did not say what to do once you grab onto the ledge. She could just say, you know, press forward to climb up or something like that. Oh well. To perform a sideways somersault, press left and jump. Yep, both sideways somersaults cover the same distance and the same thing happens with forward and backward. And don't forget, very important for combat especially, you can do mid -air roll with both forward and backward jumps. Something that's an absolute essential skill to master since Tomb Raider 2. To monkey swing, jump straight up at the bars and press and hold action, then push forward. That's that. Uh, just like in Tomb Raider 3 and 4, the controls have not changed at all. You can move forward. Whilst moving, you can tilt Lara left and right. However, and this is very important, you cannot go back. But if you hold the walk key and press sideway key, <laughs> you can basically shimmy to the sides as you could on a ledge, interestingly enough. But that's basically all you can do here. Just let go. For me to climb this wall, stand next to it and press forward and action together. Keep hold of action and push up to climb the wall. To climb around corners, just keep pushing in the desired direction. Now, if you do not give Lara enough space to fully make use of both her arms and legs, she will be in this sort of shimmying stage and only use her arms. But that is fine because you can still uh, corner shimmy crawl, onto the sides. Hold down crouch and now push forward. Okay, Lara, we'll get to that soon enough. But if you give Lara enough space to make full use of her arms and legs, she'll enter this stage. Now, uh, going up or down is now faster than it was before. However, you can also do the corner shimming from uh, this kind of animation. And if you want to get down letters very quickly, you just need to release and repress control key. It's much faster than holding down. But as you can see, uh, getting around corners on letters is easy. Once Lara initiates this animation, you can let go of the control key, unlike in Tomb Raider 4. There you had to hold it for the full duration or something bad would happen. Okay, crawling we explained, let's go forward. And again, you can use Lara's back to go down uh, from a crawl space. So in that case, you have to use the action key. If you were to do it via the forward flip, which I'm now going to show you, you have to use the jump key. I don't like these controls. Why it's not the action key for both, I truly do not understand. Okay. Another important thing about crawling, if you're in this duck position, you can get your guns out, beat Uzis or pistols, something one-handed, and fire, and you can even turn Lara. You are actually not able to turn her back in Tomb Raider 3, but in Tomb Raider 4 and 5 you finally are. Which is kind of pointless, because we only ever needed to use this in Tomb Raider 3, but... Okay, let's roll with it. Now, if you're prone, you cannot, you have to press the holster key once to go back into a duck and take the pistols out. Simple as that. To use the lever switch, stand next to the switch and press action. Okay, and this is how all the mechanisms operate. I think the only mechanisms in Tomb Raider 1 were switches like this, and then keyholes or inserts for objects, and then pushing blocks, and that was it. Okay, so this is a bit of a foreshadowing of a room where we'll go, where you can see a rope spread out across it. There is a reason that rope is there. But where we need to go right now, perhaps this can be a bit confusing, is up here. Because there is a pool of water we need to jump into to continue and get our hands on a couple of goodies. Jump into the water. Use action to swim forward and the directions to steer. Sure, we could do that. Or we could swan dive into the water. Woohoo! Awesome. When you're underwater, you can roll, so that should be fine. You can turn very quickly. I don't think this was available in Tomb Raider 1, and it was sorely missing. Okay, you can also move on the water surface, backwards, forwards, very slowly. You can even sidestep on the water surface. This was actually available since Tomb Raider 1. Press jump key to dive uh, back again. Now, if you're wondering what will happen in case you swan dive on a solid surface, it's this, just a nice somersault like this, not unlike the sprinting one. Actually, let's compare real quick. Yep, pretty much. Anyway, back to the water. We want to find an underwater tunnel, and then another underwater tunnel, which will lead into a room with a couple of goodies, which we don't want to miss. The goodies themselves will actually tell us what objects to expect in this level. Uh, actually, what weapons to expect in the Rome chapter of the game, even. 
One thing I do not like about Tomb Raider 5 is that each time you transition to a new geographical location, your inventory gets reset completely. So rather than carrying over the stuff that you pick up in earlier levels, you lose everything and your entire inventory is restarted. It's gonna make my stats video a nightmare and also it's just not very good. So be wasteful in this game. There is no reason to hoard up supplies. You're not gonna get to keep them. Well, maybe with the exception of the New York levels, there you should actually hoard supplies and not be wasteful, but we'll cross that bridge when we get there. To climb out, swim to the edge and press action. Oh, that's right. True. And here we find ourselves, above the area where we entered the first cistern. To walk the tightrope, walk up to the rope and press action. Push forward. If you unbalance, push in the opposite direction to correct. The good thing is, is that when you're at the very edge next to the rope, all you have to do is press the action key once. You don't have to hold it the entire time as you're walking on the tightrope. So that saves up some of your kinetic resources. Now I'm just holding forward. Whenever Lara starts swaying from one direction to another, I press the opposite direction. It's as easy as that. The annoying thing, and especially for people trying to complete the levels quickly or speedrunners, is this is completely randomized. You never know when Lara's gonna lose her balance. One additional thing you can do on tightropes is press back, and Lara will turn, which is really neat. But we don't want to return. Now, in case you fall from this rope or you just don't want to do it, you want to get through the level quickly, you don't have to use it at all. I did it for tutorial purposes, but as you can see, there are a couple of crates here, so you can easily climb down and up the same way. And we're on the other side of this crate, which we checked a while ago. Now, what we don't want to miss is a secret inside here. First of all, this shelf should have some goodies in it. I think it should be a box of flares. Wonderful. There we go. The other shelf uh, will have absolutely nothing in it, but even those I'm going to show you just to show you that I put my money where my mouth is. However, uh, you might be wondering, okay, what if there is an object upon a second investigation or third? Because Lara can check this infinitely, and you're right, I'm checking every single shelving in the game multiple times just to see if maybe there's some hidden pickup or something like that upon multiple retries. So far, that hasn't been the case, but I commit to trying this out across the game. Another new move that Lara is not explaining is pushing blocks. So this works just like in Tomb Raider 1. Albeit it's a bit easier now since Tomb Raider 4, because if you want to move a block multiple spaces, forward or backwards, you only need to set the direction once and keep holding the action key. This is not the case because there's space for only one move forward, but uh, we find a box of revolver bullets. Let's see, we have 12. This is the second box we picked up, so the yield is the same as in Tomb Raider 4. That's 6 per pickup, uh, 6 normal shotgun shells per pickup, and that's about it. 12 flares per pickup. Now, um, here is another shelving, and this one we get to push forward twice. So I pressed forward while holding the action key, and now all I'm doing is holding the action key, I'm not even pressing forwards, and Lara remembers the original command to move forwards. She can move it twice before there is no more space. The same thing works backwards, I'm not gonna show you to waste time, don't worry, but it is identical. And here we find a couple of Uzi clips, so those we are also going to find, I think, in the third realm level. And a shelf with our first secret object. A golden rose! Ah, so beautiful. Now, uh, this really takes me back to Tomb Raider 2. Not only is it a finally a globetrotting adventure, but again, secrets are directly tied to you finding the secret item, as opposed to stepping on a tile or anything like that. What's really neat is that there seems to be three secrets in every single level, I think with the exception of one, which has one secret or something weird like that, because there are 13 levels in this game. Uh, that would imply that the other one needs to have then two secrets. At any rate, uh, literally with the exception of I think two levels, every single one has three secrets, and the game finally goes out of its way to show you how many secrets there are in the level. If you check the statistics screen, it will show you one secret found out of 36, which is significantly less than 70 of Tomb Raider 4, which shows you how shorter the game is. 36 is the number of secrets in the entire game. But 3 is the number of secrets in the current level where you found the rogues. I think it still really sucks that uh, you do not get to know how many secrets there are in a level until you find at least the first one, or the second one, doesn't matter, until you at least find one. 
I feel like the game should have a way of informing you, even if you find none, how many you missed, but, well... I don't want to complain too much, because it's still a vast improvement over Tomb Raider 4, that's for sure. Okay, so, this is pretty much the main draw, main reason to go even into this opera backstage. Okay, this shelving is empty, the other one should have a small health pack in it. By the way, one reason... Well, one thing I want to complain about somewhat is that we do not see Lara in her evening dress. I mean, she took the Mercury Stone, put it in her stocking garter, and then just ran away on a pizza delivery guy's bike. And now she's in her classic Tomb Raider gear, and there's nothing wrong with her classic Tomb Raider gear, but there's this complete lack of a sense of continuity. And it's a shame to play as Lara in an evening dress. We're not gonna get to do that until the Japan levels in Tomb Raider Legend, right? So... Uh, oh, one important thing, the new safety drop, woohoo! Yeah, we don't really need to do it here, we wouldn't have taken any damage anyway, but still, it makes me happy. There is actually a fan-made Tomb Raider 5 Definitive Edition, I believe, which fixes this issue. You get to play as our blocky Polygon Lara in her dress, and the levels are vastly improved. I highly recommend you check it out, <laughs> but no such luck in the rushed original release. Okay, so the only way we can continue is forwards. We can take a slight detour through the left, but it's just a pointless alley. We will end up here anyway, and make a mental note of this dark block here. We need to raise it by activating a mechanism behind this grate over there. However, we need to lift the grate first. Makes sense, right? So let's go into the only area we can, into the plaza, which really reminds me of the Venice levels. And take care of a nasty dog. These Dobermans we haven't seen since the Italy levels in Tomb Raider 2, and actually, one thing I don't believe I've talked about, nor I've used the time to demonstrate, remember the enemy health bars I enabled in Tomb 5? Well, what you could have seen underneath our own health bar was in fact the dog's health bar. So you get a pretty good grasp of how much damage we are dealing with pistols. There was no way to find this out, until we encountered the Golden Ra Lara in Cleopatra's palaces in Tomb Raider 4, which was a very useful target dummy to practice weapons on. But, if you deal enough damage, you die. Not very good. This way we finally see enemies with hellbars, and it's gonna tell us a lot about some of the hidden mechanics in the background, as we'll see with one of the enemies we encounter later on. Anyway, this is the alley where the door came from. It's completely empty, devoid of any objects, any meaning. What we need to focus on is getting behind this grate. Because there lies the temple, into which we need to insert the mercury stone. But, to get there, we need a golden key into this keyhole to open the grate here and a courtyard which will allow us to get there. Unfortunately, Lara doesn't say no, but what about... No. Well, at least that. <laughs> at least we can summon it manually. Furthermore, this fountain over here is actually climbable, even though you're hanging in the air. Uh, the center is sort of a dynamic object. But you can absolutely grab this roof over here, shimmy and climb up and pick up flares, but I'm not going to do it just yet, because we're going to use that roof to get down from somewhere and pick up the flares then. So just to save a bit of time. Okay, and seems one stone face leads to another. We have opened the grate to the original one. Now we cannot interact with it again. But there are two more stone faces like this in this level, and with both of them we can interact twice, and yet they only do trigger a mechanism on the very first try. I don't know why with some you can interact twice, why with some with only once, but there you have it. Now immediately when interacting with this one, crouch, okay? You got it? Good. Crouch. And there they are. No, these are not the swarms of locusts from Tomb Raider 4, although they behave exactly the same way, which is exactly why I'm crouching. There is no point in trying to outrun these guys. They are faster than you, and if you are running, they have more of Lara's body to take chunks out of. Instead, crouch. It is the best way to conserve health. Uh, all the walkthroughs and guides I've read mentioned that you should just try and run, and it's also my natural instinct to do that, but uh, it doesn't really work. Now, uh, for full disclosure, I'm not counting these fox of bats an enemy. They are a temporary hazard. I will see about making a count for my final stats video how many of these there are in the game, perhaps, but again, completely removing them out of the enemy statistics. We'll see if it's, it'll be interesting. In Tomb Raider 4, there really was no point, because there was an infinite number of them next to the dragon in the Cairo Citadel. Ah, so many unique objects they made for this game. I'm amazed since they were in such a rush. They didn't have to do this, it could be just empty. 
Okay, we're above the street where we entered the Fountain Square, remember? That's where we killed the Doberman dog. Probably trained by the Fiamanera cultists. I mean, this is taking place before Tomb Raider 1 and 2, so... Would make sense, I guess. Maybe they have presence in Rome as well. And something we also haven't seen since Tomb Raider 2... Ah, uh, breakable windows. Since I'm finally counting breakable objects, I am also counting these, okay? <laughs> there are gonna be two more windows to, uh, to shoot through in this level. Our reward was a box of revolver bullets. This time it will be a small health pack. Now there is another window, but let's leave that uh, alone for now. I am more interested in taking care of this doggo. Okay, this is making me nervous. His pathfinding is really bad, which is good news for us. I think he might be trying to get out of this courtyard completely. Um, whew, okay, but he did not touch us, which is very good. Now I'll show you where the dog was trying to get out in a sec. Let's open this door where the mind-blowing door opening animation, which is against all Tomb Raider rules. Flip back. Oh my god. Oh, he bit us twice, that bastard. I hate this one so much. There's not much you can do to avoid taking damage, really, unless you want to immediately run and um, make it to windowsill and then spend ages trying to shoot him. Fair strategy, but that's not what I'm going to do here. Anyway, large health bag and a box of uh, white shot shotgun shells is our reward. I expect they will be just as useless in Tomb Raider 4, but you know what? I am going to do my proper testing once we find a shotgun, okay? Don't worry. In case I'll find out that there is a use for them, I'm definitely going to let you know. I'm actually thinking of one boss fight where potentially they could be better, but I wouldn't hold my breath. Anyway, we also found large health pack and our real reward is the wine keg over here. Now, to show you where the dog was trying to run, he was actually trying to get back to the Fountain Plaza and run away from Lara, which is actually kind of sad. Over here, we open a shortcut back into the Fountain Plaza, not that it's needed, I mean, potentially, if we mess up the following jump, it will allow us to get back slightly faster, but it's just completely unnecessary. And let's take a look what the courtyard looks like from the inside. Yeah, all nice and well. Okay, so... This window, the one I was keeping for the last, we're gonna enter through the street. See, that's the shortcut we opened there, so it's all connected. I like this level design into the building over here. Go to the left first, because there is a key you want to pick up to continue. That's the golden key into the golden receptacle it should go to. I believe it's even called the golden key, right? Yep, <laughs> golden key one, even though there is no two, but fine, whatever. Uh, maybe there will be later in the game, but it's definitely not in this level. Hmm. I did not want to talk over the beautiful Tomb Raider theme, but I'm still gonna take pot shots at this dog. Lara, your aim is not particularly good. I know there's a fountain in the way, but come on, girl. Good, we did not get bitten. And this is the box of flares we could have picked up earlier via climbing this roof, but I guess I just wanted to be a bit more time efficient, knowing that we're gonna find ourselves back here. Okay. So, let's insert the golden key and take a ton of damage. My goodness, I'm not looking forward to this. Although there is a way to avoid taking that damage by being smart, but I want to show you something. Look at our health bar and look at Larson's. And look at his accuracy and aim. Okay, now he escaped. Interesting thing you can see is that whenever you deal enough damage, he will escape. I think even with all weapons cheat, you would not be able to take Larson down here. So I am considering him an enemy that's in the game, but one that we cannot kill. Okay, mind you, I didn't want to use a flare, so I'm using the Binox to show you that there is a small health pack. I have missed this completely when playing the PlayStation 1 version of the game, simply because of how dark it is. The usual stuff. Now, one thing Larson has missed is a key that he and Pierre also need to get into the temple. And that's uh, the Garden Key, is what it's called, even though it's David Star. So maybe the temple whose gate it unlocks used to be in a Jewish ghetto in Rome or something like that? I have no idea. But we are actually on the lookout for another one of these. Now let's go up and up and make a full stop. You know what's gonna happen. Yeah, you can see his health bar. He is standing there. 
My god, he's just taking pot shots. Oh man, this is not good. And now his health bar has restored. Did you see that? Just before reaching a certain point, his entire health bar restored and he ran away. It's... I mean, it's not unfair. If Lara can use health packs, why shouldn't he, right? What I'm really wondering about is how on earth did he make it on the other side of this courtyard? Was Larson tightrope walking? I truly do not know. Okay. And again, it's up to Lara's randomness to see how many decides she how many times she decides to lose balance. It's very unpredictable, very annoying. You can sometimes, it's very rare, but walk the entire length of the rope without losing your balance once. It has nothing to do with your player's inputs. The control is just wrestled away from you. It's very frustrating. I'm curious how many times it will even be in the game. What if this was the final one? <laughs> we'll see. And if we drop here, we get to open a gate leading back into the fountain square. Okay. There we go. Now, ahead of us is the main temple where we want to enter the Mercury Stone, but to do that we want to open the gate here. To open the gate here we need two of the garden keys. We only have one. So let's go left first, because that's where we're gonna find it. And let's go left further to pick up a bo uh, box of revolver shots. They're really feeding them to us like candy, and I think revolver is gonna be our main weapon of choice soon. Now, mind this gate over here. This is another gate that can be opened via crowbar that we don't have, or via the action key, or even via being shot at. You need to trigger a mechanism in the temple, and then retrace your steps back here to find the gate open. Because behind the gate is the second secret, and a very nasty dog waiting for us, which, who is probably gonna kill us. We'll see. So, uh, I don't like how many secrets in Tomb Raider 5 are related to you just randomly backtracking when triggering unrelated mechanisms. I do not like it. Important thing, revolver, 24 shots and we should be at 30, right? Yes, exactly, so one box uh, of revolver bullets awarded when we get our hands on it. So this is, I guess, gonna be our main weapon from now on. I will have also stopped using pistols. I wanna see if from this point on, now that we have a different weapon, we can get through the entire Rome chapter without using our pistols. So I guess no pistols challenge initiated. I have no idea what's gonna happen and I might regret it horribly, but it sure as hell is gonna be fun. Now, important thing, let's make a step or a hop back. The street over there, uh, why not use a binox? This is going to be important because that right there is a door. We're going to open that from inside the temple courtyard and make a jump over here to trigger another mechanism to get inside the temple. But furthermore, that room over there contains the third secret and I'll show you where. Just make a note of that. I think this long drop is also where I'm going to demonstrate the potency of a safety drop via crawling forward. First of all, another door to just open nonchalantly. On the left in this musky wine cellar, although I think it must smell great, we'll find a laser sight. Hooray! So we can absolutely upgrade it with our revolver. From now on, when you use Loki when having a weapon like this equipped, you can use it the same way as Binox. Although it's red now, not green, it's not really easy on the ice. But if you press the action key, you will not light up light, you will instead fire. Uh, the light is on by default anyway, so there really is no point. It kind of replaces the binoculars in the entirety. The reason there is a laser sight is for you to shoot the padlock on this gate and open it up. By the way, just like the windows, I am definitely counting this as a breakable object. If you don't want to waste revolver ammo, you can. It takes a while. You can shoot it with your pistols via shooting and crawling. But remember what I did? I said no pistols challenge initiated. So <laughs> we need to waste that shot now. Roll forward, grab it, and immediately run away because there is a swarm of rats. Now, rats, unlike death beetles, are temporary, thank goodness. So, but as a result, I'm not counting them as an unkillable enemy because they are a temporary hazard that will disappear. Uh, they are too small to be shot, they will just keep taking damage. Uh, if you wait long enough in that wine cellar or somewhere else, they will dissipate, okay? So again, they are not like uh, the swarms of beetles. However, we don't have any health to spare, considering also what's up ahead, so I didn't want to do that. Now, here we enter a small courtyard. We'll actually be on the roofs above it, uh, getting our hands on a couple of goodies. But let's insert both the garden keys over here. 
This will kind of annoyingly not open the gate in front of us, but the one connected to the side street. It's really not practical, is it? Okay, now that is ominous. There are three Hydra heads above the door where we want to enter, enter into temple to get our hands on the Philosopher's Stone. You could see there were four receptacles with four symbols and let me highlight that with our Binox. And that right there is the so-called Mercury symbol. The Mercury stone we have in our inventory is something that needs to be combined with it in its receptacle to be complete, but then we are missing three entire keys. We are gonna find, I think, uh, the Saturn symbol, the one on the right over here, uh, later on in the level, and we're gonna finish the level simply by finding it and walking away. Uh, then the next level is gonna be all about finding the remaining two symbols and inserting them, uh, having a bit of a boss fight and entering this temple which leads to Colosseum for some reason where the Philosopher's Stone should be. What I really like is that these are all alchemical symbols and it's kind of a nice tie to the themes of the Angel of Darkness where alchemy is uh, prevalent, right? I'd like to think that this was intended. Maybe I'm giving them too much credit, but still, it's neat. Uh, on the side over here is an empty pool, pointless area. It's really just a foreshadowing. This area, this room will be useful in the next level because this block will disappear, uh, revealing a tunnel f uh, back here from the next level, right? But for now, there is no point. If you approach the door, you will trigger a cutscene during which Lara will insert the Mercury Stone into the Mercury Symbol, so say farewell to the Mercury Stone. I hope to achieve with this mindless firing. Ain't mindless? Ain't we trying to kill her anymore then? You were kicked in the head by a horse, we? So the brain doesn't work correctly? How'd you know about that? Never mind. Never mind. We wait until she collects the other pieces. In this fashion, we have the full price at no extra effort. You is one clever cookie, boss. Comparatively, yes. Come, let's get off this roof, and I will buy you a milkshake. <laughs> ah, again, love the cutscenes here. I love that Pierre is so kind and feeling sorry for Larson being kicked in the head by the horse that he is going to buy him a milkshake. Actually, during one of our Tomb Raider charity streams in our community for Extra Life, our greater missus, she was using the I'm gonna buy you a milkshake as a command on Twitch. It was, I don't know, it was really wonderful. Um, so I guess we know why Larson is the way he is. Uh, of course, that's not the case in Tomb Raider Anniversary. There he is taken a bit more seriously, but uh, I don't know. I just find these characters really endearing, and I feel sorry for them in a way that they get in Lara's way. But what else can you expect? So again, Lara has entered the Mercury Stone there. We no longer have it in our inventory. Only the Golden Rose, and the Mercury Stone is complete. That's one down, three more to go. Uh, the second one we're gonna find later. Make a note of this dark alley behind the temple. Whilst there's nothing here in the next level, there should be a large health pack to help you with the boss fight here, right? So maybe just make another note of that. When we go up, in the Tomb Raider's Traveler's Guide there was mentioned an encounter with a Doberman dog here. Uh, neither in PC or PSX version I was able to find a dog here. I don't think that's correct. Well, as far as hints go, that one is not very subtle. The bell. Now, what can we do with a bell? Ring it. And how do you ring a bell? You apply force on it. Thankfully, we have all the tools we need at our disposal. Now, there are two dark grates on the side here, but these will never open and these lead into nowhere. I'm trying to get a good look with the Binox, but it seems to be just an empty room with dark tiles. Nothing important. This is where the Saturn symbol is, where we need to go. To open it, we need to trigger a mechanism inside the temple. Whereas the bell itself uh, will open a door 
on the side of this wall. First of all, if the camera sweeping shot wasn't enough of a hint, you have a second laser sight. No, by getting another laser sight, you do not find any inventory to combine with another weapon. In Tomb Raider 5, I don't mind. Revolver and later on Desert Eagle are the only weapons we can combine it with. We no longer have crossbow that we could combine it with as well. I guess it's just in case you missed it, but in order to get here you need a garden key, which you need to get via shooting a padlock, so I guess if you missed it and shot the padlock via your pistols, they placed it here just as an extra measure. I, I don't know what their thought process was. Anyway, another box of those bullets, which is sweet since we are on our no pistols challenge. And this is the door we will open via using that bell. Uh, let's make sure we aim accurately. Even from this side, it will work out fine. <laughs> and the door opened. Okay. So now, do you know what street we are above? The one where we find the revolver and the one where I'm going to demonstrate the safety drop. Oh no, crawl, Lara! I forgot about you guys, and we took a bit more damage than I would have liked. Still taking, still taking damage. Get lost! Leave me alone! Leave me alone, I'm busy! Leave me alone, I'm busy! Like the infamous guy in Angel of Darkness says. Okay, good, they're gone. Now, upon triggering this mechanism, we hear a sound of a door opening, but it's nothing to the sides, instead the temple door has opened. How are we supposed to know? No idea. Just by going back, I guess. Now, important thing. There is a dynamic wall on this side and a dynamic wall over on this side. And to open these, uh, we will need to again retrace our steps after triggering a mechanism in the temple because it leads to the third and final secret of the game. Talking about secrets, I'm gonna go and reach the second one. First of all, I'm going to make a first save here because I want to demonstrate something very important. Safety drop. If you fall down like this, Lara will break her neck, okay? Because we did not do a safety drop and we had little health remaining. Funnily enough, this is the game over screen which I really missed from the PC version, so I patched it back via the multi-utility. <laughs> it just emphasizes the point that you failed or that something wrong happened. So let us reload. Now, if you use the safety drop, and it doesn't really matter if you do it like this, or if you do it from crawl backwards, the result will be the same, Lara hanging like this. You will take some damage, see, but Lara just barely survives. However, if you do it with a forward crouch flip, rather than the normal safety drop, you end up with a slightly larger sliver of health. This means that this is a safer safety drop you can implement in this game. My god, this blew my mind when I found out. I'm sure the expert Tomb Raider community already knows about this, but I haven't really seen that information online anywhere. I guess it's more of a word of a mouth knowledge. But again, <laughs> so happy to share this with you guys. Uh, now, we are on our way to the second secret, but there is a dog here that's gonna appear and just rip us to shreds. Oh my god, look at our health! So we can still withstand one bite. Okay, we are gonna finish this level without using health packs. This is my commitment to you guys. Look at that. Bloody Larson. <laughs> okay, okay, my heart is racing. Uh, on the left over here you will find a large health pack. On the right over here, the second golden rose. Lara, please cooperate. Thank you very much, Miss Croft. Okay. Thank you very much. So, again, looking into our inventory screen, you can see two out of three roses, but using the stat screen, two out of 36. Simple, easy. Finally, both the level count and the entire game count. Now, let's just retrace our steps, because I, by dropping here, not only did I take uh, unnecessary damage, but I used it as an opportunity to show you the safer safety drop, new to Tomb Raider 5, but we now have to retrace our steps back. We need to enter the temple, solve its puzzle, which will not only allow us to get uh, our hands on the second key, but also uh, the third secret. And I'm kind of wondering what order to do the things in. You know what? If you've been paying close attention to the cutscene with Pierre and Larson, you might have noticed that there were some goodies behind them. First of all, let's get on the rooftop that they were at. This right here, and this is how they were observing Lara putting the Mercury Stone in, which is kind of funny to think about. <laughs> yeah, they had a good view. This is where it happened. This is where the milkshake sentence occurred and changed the history of Tomb Raider forever. 
But behind them, if you've been paying attention, you could see the revolver bullets and the large health pack. Okay? So, let's get here. I don't want to die. I'm so glad we killed that dog without it killing us. Um, let's just make it across back and now enter the temple. There is something dangerous in the temple, but it's an all or nothing kind of deal. So I'm not worried about losing health, I'm worried about dying outright. But I sure as hell don't want to repeat the fight with the dog. That was once in a million survival. Hmm, mischievous music. Two crows watching us as we entered. You can see some weight pattern uh, under the edges of the particles. That's not a coincidence. Coincidence. Inside every crow is a... I guess we could call it a dove, really, a dove of peace trapped inside. We need to free them. Uh, we're basically gonna break the outer statue shell so that the pedestal will unlock and Lara will be able to move it 90 degrees. Again, I have no idea why. First of all, there is no reason to go to the right, only to the left. Oh, and make a note of that battering them over there. That's the one thing that can mess up the run of this level without using health packs. We'll, we'll see. But I cannot call it a deathless run because I kind of killed myself intentionally to demonstrate safety walk. So there. Okay. Let's see what happens. <sighs> Love that sound. This is not the same sound as usually when objects are broken, but it's still nice. But the particle effect is the same. It's the reason why I'm gonna consider this an object broken. Both of these crow statues. I'm gonna include in my stats. Now, no matter which direction you approach the pedestal from, it could really be from anywhere. Lara will always turn it 90 degrees to the left, so the dove is gonna end up facing the same direction. There we go. And now that we did that, the door has opened on the right side and the battering ram is in full swing. We need to trigger another switch before this crow will explode. So let's go on to this side and overcome the last obstacle of this level and hopefully without dying. Um... Okay, and quickly, Laura! Okay, uh... It's possible that you can do it completely safely from a crawl. Please let me know in the comments in case you try that and it will work out. I just didn't want to test that looking at a health bar. I mean, this is, outside of it being invisible, this is the lowest I think you can get. <laughs> okay. And it's a nice showcase of Lara's concave and convex corner shimming. I'm happy that they included a puzzle using this in the first level. I think we used it in Tomb of Seth in Tomb Raider 4, so the first proper level, but it was more of an optional secret, not necessary to continue. But anyway, another particle effect explosion. Enjoy. <laughs> I don't know why I find this amusing. It's the little things in life, I guess. Okay, and let me drop and pray we do not take any damage from this. I actually should have used the crawl forward safety drop. My mistake. If I was to die there, that would be fully deserved. Okay, and let's again turn it by 90 degrees to the left. They'll both awkwardly end up facing that side, which isn't even the side of the door that open. But... Oh my god, I figured it out. This is a hint for the third secret. Now, we don't have a compass, so I cannot tell if it's north, west, south or east, but they are both facing that direction. That direction. So we need to go there. That's the hint, I think. You know what? I think I'm overthinking and giving the devs too much credit because there was no hint for the second secret. Anyway. Let's make it inside. No more bets, please. Oh, thank goodness, they do not respawn after loading. And get our hands on the third and final secret of this level. So there is a golden rose. And uh, there is a small health pack. Wonderful. So let's just go back without killing ourselves. Again, that brings us to the total of three secrets. And you can see three roses uh, out of three in this level. When we enter the next level, the golden roses are gonna disappear from our inventory, just like the golden skulls from Angkor Wat in Tomb Raider 4, but have no fear, that doesn't mean the secret count will, okay? Now, uh, let's enter here and pick up the Saturn symbol. I think that's what it's called, right? Wonderful, I remember it well. No. Yes, Lara, do not contradict me. Now, before you make another step, Let's make a save here, because the moment you touch the first step, it's uh, the level is over and we'll find ourselves in the next cutscene. So, 
uh, let me take a look at our statistics screen. This was Streets of Rome. Very long level since I decided to explain some of the control schemes, some of the new moves and so on, but you know my let's play style at this point. <laughs> the first level, I really enjoyed it, very interconnected, and reminded me of the Venetian sections in Italy in Tomb Raider 2. We have taken 50 minutes, traveled 3,685 meters. Uh, you can see how much squares that is next to it. We have fired 20, uh, 245 shots. We have not used any health packs. I cannot believe to tell you how proud I am of this because of all the flocks of bats, the swarms of rats and Larsen taking pot shots at us and the viciously placed dogs. And we have found all three secrets, found all 33 items killed five out of six enemies. I consider Lars an enemy that we didn't kill because the bastard pops a health bag and runs away. And we have broken all six objects. So with that firmly in mind, let me make a save here and I will see you guys after the amazing cutscene in Trajan's markets. Calm, calm, Lara. We're all friends here. Begging your pardon, ma'am, but if you'd like to put them pea shooters away. Ah. Now, the second stone, if you please, Miss Croft. Come get it. Mm. It's a little too late in the evening for these games. Larson, search her, if you please. Well, god darn if I don't get all the best jobs. You want to try the back pockets? Listen! Oh. Enough! Oh. Enough! My patience is exhausted with this childish nonsense! The stone, Miss Croft! If you put this into that gate, Pierre, you're going to get a lot more than you bargained for. Trust me. I'll put it in, then. That would be one of the stupidest moves you've made. And that's saying something. I think you'll appreciate. Uh... A nice try as always, Miss Croft. Wait for it. Don't say I didn't warn you. What is it? What have we done? In your usual flamboyant style, you have set in motion the next gate phase. Next gate phase? If my memory serves me, the gate has realigned itself. And if it does not receive two stones in the next few moments... <sighs> if I was you, I'd grab your Cro-Magnon cowboy over there and run as fast as your little legs can carry you. Au revoir, mon cher. <laughs> 